Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Japan has been having quite a 2024, making some serious headlines with the successful debut of their H-3 rocket and the less successful debut of their Kairos rocket, which was, well, the first failure of the year. Last year, I did a video about Japan's solid rocket launch vehicles, and I realized that I never really did a follow-up for the liquid-fueled launch vehicles. So yeah, in the 1960s, Japan had progressed from their tiny pencil rockets to larger solid fuel sounding rockets, which would regularly fly to space. And they were working on the Lambda 4S, which on paper would launch satellites into orbit. These were notable because they launched at a bit of an angle so that the first stages could remain unguided. So after a number of failed attempts, they would eventually get to orbit in 1970 with a satellite called Osumi. But Japan had big plans for spaceflight. They wanted to put spacecraft into geostationary orbit, and for that they would need a bigger rocket. And so instead of spending years developing this launch vehicle on their own, they essentially signed a deal with the USA, which would allow the transfer of US technology to Japan, specifically the Thor Delta launch vehicle. If you look here, we have on the left a Thor Delta N launch vehicle. On the right, we have... Uh, Japan's N1, not to be confused with the Soviet Union's N1, of course. So yeah, Japan got a head start on their large launch vehicle. McDonnell Douglas licensed the core of the long tank Thor uh, to Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. The Rocketdyne MB3 engine would also be built by Ishikawajima Harima Heavy Industries, and the Thiokol Castor 2 solid rocket motors would be built by Nissan, yes, the car company. So that made for a first stage that was 21 and a half meters tall, 2.44 meters wide, and about 72 tons fully fueled with kerosene and liquid oxygen. The three Castor 2 boosters would add about four and a half tons each, bringing the first stage mass to about 85 tons. The second stage, however, would actually feature some Japanese technology. The tanks were the same design as the Delta. They used the same propellant, nitrogen tetroxide and aerosene 50. But the engine for the second stage was the LE3 that had been developed by Japan to replace the AJ-10 engine uh, on the Delta. So this was a pressure-fed hypergolic engine, very simple. It produced about five and a half tons of thrust. So the stage it was about 1.5 meters wide, 5.25 meters long, and had about 4.7 tons of propellant, which, yeah, it made it the same as the equivalent Delta. Steering on the second stage would be provided by a pair of Vernier engines, which were licensed from TRW. Finally, the third stage used a Thiokol Star 37A, about 0.8 tons of solid rocket motor for that final push into orbit. So this launch vehicle gave Japan access to geostationary orbit with a payload of about 360 kilograms to transfer orbit, maybe 150 kilograms into actual geostationary orbit once you added the mass of the kick motor. The first N1 launch took place on 9th of September 1975 from Tanegashima Space Center carrying a spacecraft called Kiku, which is a 85 kilogram engineering test satellite that was used for technical experiments regarding tracking and performance, launch and control. And about 18 months later, in February of 1977, the N1 was able to launch Kiku-2 into geostationary orbit, becoming uh, Japan's first geostationary satellite, making them the third country to put a satellite into geostationary orbit after the USA and the Soviet Union. And so between 1975 and 1982, there were seven N1 launches, all of them successful in contrast to the Soviet version. However, there were two flights that uh, were carrying the Ayami geostationary satellites, and both of those were lost due to problems with their Apogee kick motor, nothing to do with the launch vehicle. But despite this success rate, the N1 was already underpowered by the time it debuted in 1975, and Japan had satellite ambitions which were beyond the capabilities of their own N1, and they would actually launch the Himawari-1 geostationary weather satellite on a US-made Delta-2914 in 1977, and then they would also launch the Yuri communication satellite again on a Delta a year later. So, they devised uh, a successor, the N2. What a name, huh? 
it was an enhancement of the N1. It took even more US licensed technology. To get the extra performance, they stretched the first stage from the long tank Thor to the extended long tank Thor version. The second stage was made as wide as the first stage, making it an early version of the straight eight Delta. And they switched over to using an AJ-10 engine licensed direct from Aerojet. This was the AJ-10-118FJ, J to say that it was built in Japan. Also, they uh, added nine solid rocket motors on the first stage instead of three. And the Star 37 on the third stage was uh, basically 60% bigger, so it had more impulse. With all these enhancements, the N2 effectively doubled its payload to geostationary orbit, and Japan was quite happy to use it. It launched eight times from 1981 to 1987, primarily with geostationary satellites. And the one exception was the final launch where it carried a satellite called Marine Observation Satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. And notably, on this uh, launch, they did not include the Star 37 third stage. So having built up a bit of experience in the manufacturing of launch vehicles, Japan wanted to properly strike out on their own, and so their next step was the H-1. The H-1 would be the first Thor-derived launch vehicle to use a hydrogen-fueled second stage. So the first stage was the same as the, the N-2. Uh, the second stage had the tank stretched to accommodate the lower density propellant. It was almost twice the length, something like 10 meters, with a mass of 10 tons, 80% of which was the hydrogen and oxygen propellant. So the engine for the second stage was the LE-5, a gas generator driven hydrogen oxygen engine developed by Mitsubishi. And today the H-3 rocket still uses a derivative of the LE-5. So the engine would get a thrust of about 10 tons with a much higher specific impulse compared to the LE-3 that Japan had previously developed. Also, Nissan developed a larger third stage motor, the UM129A, which almost doubled the amount of propellant that was available compared to the N2. So in total, the H1 now massed about 140 tons at takeoff. It was 40 meters tall. I could launch uh, about 1.1 tons into geostationary orbit. So it would debut in 1986 and launch nine times uh, through 1992. And basically development of the H2 would pretty much begin right away because that large first stage and those castor engines were all still American technology. And so we come to the H2. This would debut in 1994 and it would be all changed. First of all, the core diameter, which had been about 2.4 meters, was now over four meters. Both stages were now hydrogen. The first stage was propelled by a new LE7 engine. This was a high performance staged combustion engine generating about 90 tons of thrust at sea level. The first stage was about 30 meters tall. Those nine uh, castor solid rocket motors, they were removed and instead there were two large solid rocket motors that had been developed uh, by Nissan. These would generate about 170 tonnes of thrust each for about 90 seconds, while the core would burn onwards after that for about another four and a half minutes. The second stage now used a, a new version of the LE5. They'd switched away from the gas generator, removing that hardware, and instead they used an expander bleed cycle. That is where the hydrogen is heated by flowing it around the combustion chamber, and as it heats up, it expands into a gas, and you let that expansion, expanding gas flow through a turbine, capture that energy, and use it to drive the propellant pumps. It's similar to the RL-10 engine, which is used on the Centaur, but the difference is the RL-10 takes the exhaust gas from the turbine and puts it into the combustion chamber and gets slightly better specific impulse, whereas the LE-5 has an easier time scaling to higher thrusts. So the second stage was five meters long, allowing for 14 tons of propellant. And at this point, they did not need that third stage kick motor. Uh, it, in total, the vehicle would stand about 49 meters tall and mass 250 tons at launch, able to throw about 1.8 tons into geostationary orbit. So the H2 would launch uh, seven times, but there was a couple of interesting variants. First of all, there was the H2+, Plus, which was used on the third launch to launch Himawari 5. In addition to the regular large solid rocket motors, they added a pair of smaller socket solid rocket motors that added about 60 tons of thrust for the early part of the flight. And then there was the H2 
S. And this was a transitional design between the H2 and the H2A, the successor to the H2. And the main difference was that they took the second stage from the H2A and put it on the H2 and used it to launch. And unfortunately, that launch was a failure. Now, that failure had nothing to do with the second stage. It was actually to do with the LE7 engine, which had uh, a vibration problem, which they had noticed on many flights. And this one actually caused an engine failure. They literally did a deep sea recovery on the rocket wreckage to try and understand this and improve the engine, which would ultimately result in the LE-7A, which not only fixed this problem, but also reduced the cost. This involved reconfiguring a lot of the plumbing and stuff to minimize welding, and that's why the two engines look very different. And cost reduction was generally the theme with the H-2A rocket. First of all, those big solid rocket motors, those had been built in segments just like the space shuttle motors, but it turned out that that had a lot of problems. It took a lot of time and, and effort to build these, and they realized it would be cheaper to go with smaller solid rocket motors, and as a consequence, this meant that they could also change the number of solid boosters depending upon the mission requirements. So there were actually four variants of the rocket carrying different numbers of solid rocket motors to carry different payloads. As I mentioned, there was also changes to the second stage. Now, the original H2 used a second stage with a common bulkhead between the two tanks. And it turns out that it's cheaper to build if you have two separate tanks. It just adds a bit more mass, but they decided to go with the cheaper option rather than the lighter option. They also expanded the tanks a bit, adding about 20% more fuel. The engine was also upgraded from the LE-5A to the LE-5B, which provided more thrust mainly. And so the H2A first launched in 2001, and it still launches today. Its most recent launch was the slim lunar lander and the CRISM you know, X-ray telescope. But Japan needed a bigger rocket still. It needed something to launch cargo to the International Space Station on board, the, on board their HTV vehicle. And so they developed the H2B. The main difference here is the first stage is now 5.2 meters in diameter, so fatter. And it now has two of those LE7A engines on there. This version is all about lift, so it needs all four solid rocket motors. There's not a version with two solid rockets. And it's flown a total of nine times carrying HTV cargo ferries to the International Space Station. And so we arrive at today with the recent successful debut of the H3 rocket and the last year's less than successful debut of the H3 rocket. So the H3, it basically takes the 5.2 meter diameter main tank of the H2B and makes the whole rocket that diameter. The first stage gets stretched to 36 meters, that's about 20% longer. The second stage is longer, and there's now new engines on both stages. The second stage gets a new version of the LE-5B, and this is again mostly about optimizing cost and making sure that they're not relying on obsolete components. But the real evolution has happened at the engines on the booster. Now they're using a pair of LE9 engines. This is a new engine which was developed to be cheaper than the LE7. As I said, the LE7 was a cutting edge staged combustion engine, ultra high performance, just like space shuttle engines, the same kind of engine cycle. The LE9 uses an expander bleed cycle, which we've already mentioned. It's not a closed cycle. It means because it's not closed, you can actually scale it up a whole lot compared to like the RL10. And they believe this is cheaper to manufacture. It eliminates a lot of uh, complexity to the engine design and should bring the cost down. On the first flight, that first stage operated perfectly. It was the ignition of the second stage that failed. And as I mentioned, a number of components had been replaced and clearly something was missed. The H3 has a number of variants. First of all, the core can either have three engines or two engines on it. There's a three engine variant which flies without solid rocket motors. And then there's two twin engine variants which fly with either two or four solid rocket motors. And you might think there might be some extra big version with three engines and three and four solid rocket motors, but apparently they didn't find a market, you know, a need for that. So now that the H3 has proved itself, the plan is that it is going to be starting to launch all the payloads. There are still a couple of H2A payloads on the calendar for our customers, 
But uh, moving forward, it'll all be H3. And notably, the HTV, uh, you know, cargo transfer vehicle, is being replaced by a new one called the HTV-X, which has been redesigned again to optimize for cost, and it will fly on the H3. And so that is my quick history of Japanese liquid-fueled launch vehicles. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.